Coming up next on Boston Rock Talk, Cracker. We sit down for a chat with band leader David Lowry as he talks about his band and the changes the internet has brought to the music world. My name is Tim Sullivan and welcome to Boston Rock Talk. We're here today with David Lowry. David wears a couple of hats as the leader of Camper Van Beethoven and Cracker and actually another hat, uh, champion artist rights uh, these days in the 21st century. So David, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good to be here. Good to have you here. David is doing double duty tonight at the Middle East Club here in Cambridge and uh, we're, we're speaking about all things uh, music and, and otherwise. Yeah. Uh, let's start with the music and the idea that you are pulling this double duty thing here. Uh -huh. What kind of job is it fronting two bands playing two sets a night? Well, it's a little bit of a longer show than what I'd normally do, but um, it has a break in the middle. You know, I, I remember going to see The Grateful Dead, and I was like, why would they take a break in the middle of their show, right? And I was like, now I think, wow. How civilized. Well, theirs would, be, theirs would be to do acid, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know. <laughs> or, or something like that. Or, I mean, we, we actually played three shows with the Grateful Dead. They seemed to actually go and have lunch and, and stuff like that. But um, you, you have a funny story about meeting Garcia, don't you? Yeah. Um, in 1994, <laughs> four, um, we played with the Grateful Dead in Eugene, Oregon. And... Um, I was, we hadn't met anybody from the band yet, and we were about to go on. I was standing at the bottom of the steps going up to the stage, and that's, of course, also where the porta potties are and stuff like that. So I'm standing right next to the porta potties, and somebody comes out of the porta potty and bumps right into me, and it's Jerry Garcia, right? And so I get to meet my idol just as he's coming out of a porta potty, and he's, oh, hi. And he's shaking my hands, and I completely ruined the moment because I'm sitting there thinking, like, there's no sink in there. <laughs> shaking his hand, but I'm not even hearing anything he's saying because there's no sink in there. Yeah. Anyway, that's what happened. Rock star that. They wandered off, so that was my moment, my moment of, <laughs> of meeting my hero. But and it, with the Camper and Cracker thing, I guess first of all, I mean, maybe tell people about Camper, how that got going. Yeah. Uh, well, Camper Van Beethoven started in uh, 1983 in Redlands, California, and it was just a group of friends of, of mine from there, and uh, we were sort of all playing a wrong instrument. Like I had always been the bass player in bands up to that point, and but I'd sang a little bit and I wrote a lot of songs, so I switched over to playing guitar. And so everybody was kind of learning their instruments, and it was a side project for many years. We were all in other bands, and uh, you know it was kind of silly little side projects. Our songs were really simple. They weren't like the punk rock or post-punk mm -hmm. stuff that we were playing with our other bands. And uh, Quirky they were. They were quirky. And part of it was out of necessity because we just really were all learning our instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, Victor was learning to play bass. Jonathan was learning to play violin because so he was a guitar player. So you didn't know what chords were supposed to follow what chords? Well, right? <laughs> we, we kind of knew that, but we just couldn't <laughs> execute very well. Right. And, and but it, but because it was a side band, we were able to just sort of take all these chances that we, you know, because it wasn't our serious band. Mm -hmm. So we were like, well, who cares, you know? And then people really sort of enjoyed the informality of our show and kind of this, it was really different. Every, all music was so serious then. Mm -hmm. You think 83, 84, really, really mm -hmm. serious. Yeah. And we were more lighthearted and we started getting a following from people who were in other bands who would have us open for them. You know, people like the Meat Puppets, uh, you know, people like the Dead Kennedys and stuff like that. We were the antithesis in a way of, of sort of the punk rock audiences. Mm -hmm. I mean, we knew those bands, we knew that scene. And um, so they'd give us these chances to open for them. And eventually, somehow, we realized that the popularity of Camper Van Beethoven was eclipsing our serious bands. So we made an album, um, basically started out, the, did the first four albums independently. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we paid for them ourselves. We figured out how to promo and market the records. I mean, 1984, it was the beginning of the indie rock movement. Right. We were right there in the vanguard. And we were called indie rock because we didn't use the traditional distributors. We used the independent distributors. Our records were largely only available in independent record stores. It was a completely separate economic system for selling music for bands. And the other term was college rock, I guess, because you were played on college radio. College radio, although that came a little later. Did I mean, it? That's yeah. like people, I mean, people like R.E.M. and stuff like that were definitely had exploited that early on and were embraced there. But, uh, you know, one of the things why we sent our records to college radio was simply because a friend of mine who worked at SST Records says, you should send your records to college radio because most Record labels don't send their records to college radio, mm -hmm. and it's a place that you can get airplay. Mm -hmm. And you and Johnny Hickman put Cracker together, I believe, in 1990 or so? That... We put Cracker together in 1990, uh, kind of around September, October. Mm -hmm. We started writing songs for uh, Cracker around then. You have done something rather unique in that you've put out a double album, uh, one side a rock and roll record, kind of a uh -huh. punk rock garage record, uh -huh. the other side. Uh, very much a, a country record, California country record, uh -huh. and the two cities, Berkeley and Bakersfield, two very different uh -huh. places in California, both of which you're familiar with. You want to tell people about those two locations as sort of primary settings for your music? Yeah, um, well, you know, as many people know, Cracker's a little bit of an odd band because we have one foot in sort of the alternative rock world and we have one foot sort of in Americana, roots mm -hmm. rock, uh, country even. And those have kind of always been sort of woven in and out of the albums. And like 10 years ago, we did one album that was just almost all covers where we just did country songs, right? So I started thinking, it's like, maybe it's time for us to do that again because, you know, it's so much part of our sound. And so I was working on the, the batch of the country songs when we decided to go to Berkeley and record for three days with Michael Urbano and, and Davey Farragher, who are largely, you could consider them the original rhythm section of mm -hmm. Cracker, certainly the rhythm section that played with us when we made our big hits. Mm -hmm. So we went up to Berkeley for three days, like, let's see if we can write some songs, you know? And we did three days in the studio and banged out what is basically the Berkeley disc for that. Nine or ten songs on that. Yeah, oh, there's, wow. there was more, but we threw a few of them away. Wow. But, um, but, or maybe we'll use them later. Nothing's ever thrown away. Um, an idea is always still a good idea eventually. Uh, but, but we, so we banged out this disc uh, and I brought it home and I was listening to it and I was listening to it against the country stuff which was really in its early stages and you know, I was just sort of thinking wow these are totally different and then my wife came home from work and she's like oh those aren't the same records <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're like but the idea came out of that it's like well maybe we should embrace that and it should be two discs and you know one disc is you know the alt rock with the original rhythm section mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. Uh, and one disc should be through this Americana stuff that we're working on. Mm -hmm. And the, the two collections got codenamed Berkeley and Athens because we were recording the other stuff in Athens. And of course, that doesn't sound very good. No. That's, well, what are they talking about? Well, Greece? Yeah. What does that mean? Well, yeah, I mean, we were talking well, about Athens, Georgia. Yeah, well, even if yeah. you got that, it'd still be what you're yeah. talking about. <laughs> so in California, a lot of people may not realize this, but California has its own little country music heritage. It's never been as big as Nashville, but we have Mer our own Merle little... Merle Haggard's hometown, right? Merle Haggard. We have Buck Owens. Dwight Yoakam came to California because he was influenced by that yeah. sound, and he came from... I think he's from Kentucky. I'm not really sure. Uh, he came out there for that sound. So, you know, we've had this heritage, so we stuck Bakersfield on, you know, as a working title for the, for the, the Americana and the country disc. And then, well, that sort of gave us some subject matter, you know. Uh, well, Bakersfield, okay, so, wow. I, write, I was working on this one song that became King of Bakersfield, and suddenly, having the word Bakersfield in the title, I realized, was like, oh, wow, I have a great chorus now. You know, I have a great song title as King of Bakersfield. Mm -hmm. 
um, sort of began to glue that disc together by setting it in Bakersfield. And then all these other songs came out of it, like, you know, Almond Grove, which I don't know if people realize this, it's in the southern part of the Central Valley. It's a lot of ranches, a lot of orchards. There's a lot of almonds and nuts and things like that grown there. And, and let me ask yeah. you about that specifically. I think that's one of the songs uh, you'll be playing here with uh, us later. Uh, it's like a lot of your songs. It's, it's dark and it's uh -huh. light. It's kind of sad. Uh -huh. um, tell people a little bit. It's, it's a character song, I know. Yeah. It's about a family. But tell people a little bit about it, if you would. Well, it's, it's the song that ties the Berkeley half of the record to the Bakersfield half of the record because the character is in the East Bay and he's down and out. He's living on International Boulevard in... in uh, he's living on International Boulevard in Oakland, which is always been kind of a rough area and mm -hmm. stuff like that. He's a junkie and then he tells his story from there is that he came from the southern Central Valley, a place called Maricopa. You find out that his parents have passed away, his brother is killed in Kandahar uh, and he takes the car and goes and lives in Oakland but he becomes like basically, he works at the port of Oakland, he becomes a junkie and he, he's the, through the whole song you realize he's talking about, you know, he's, through the whole song he's talking about going home and, uh, and then, you know, you get the third verse you realize, oh, he OD'd. And, um, yeah, so it's just a very sad song, but it's also, um, in some ways, it's me playing with some of the classic archetypes of country music. I mean, basically, I wrote a modern-day Green Green Grass of Home. Mm -hmm. If you've ever yeah. noticed yeah. what Green Green Grass of Home is really about, yeah. um, it does the same thing. Oh, he's singing about going home. Oh, he's, it's how home, nice. Home is, home is. And then the third verse is you realize he's... The permanent home is under the, the ground. Home. Under yes. the yeah. Yeah. One yeah. of the other things I think you're doing today, El Comandante from the Rock uh -huh. Record. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, a little bit about that too. Just to, um, that's an interesting song. There's a bag of weed involved in that song. Yeah. Seems kind of circles around. What, what what's happening there? Uh, El Comandante is uh, I I don't know. You know that was just <laughs> that was just one of those songs. Every once in a while you write a song in like five minutes or something like that, <laughs> and we were just sort of we were just playing in the studio. And, Berkeley, and we kind of got into that pocket. And we're like, it needs a bridge, it needs a bridge. And somebody figured out some chords, and then we have a bridge. And uh, I was singing El Comandante, your daughter, she's so fine, El Comandante, it's just a bag of weed. I mean, literally, I was just singing things while we were making it up. <laughs> and so I had to back out from that and back into a story. You know, it's you're the young man, and you're not seen as as a acceptable prospect mm -hmm. for your daughter mm -hmm. and you're pleading with the father that, you know. Dude, it's only weed. Dude, it's only a bag of weed. Right, so, exactly, yeah. exactly. Wait, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful little throwaway. And, and the thing that makes <laughs> the song not a throwaway though, is that um, the, 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 the element to the song that I really like is that Davy Farragher sings this straight he plays a really strange bass line in the song and then sings along with it in unison mm -hmm. and it gives a little soul element to mm -hmm. it which is underlies what would normally be just almost like a neil young throwaway when you put this together uh this huge package if you will uh, yeah. in this day and age I mean, was there any thought of, oh my God, we're giving people too much to swallow? Or was it just like, hey, this is where we're at and they can stream it, download it, buy uh, it, however yeah. they want it. But yeah, it's yeah. ambitious, I'm being honest. Yeah, I mean, making yeah. a double album these days yeah. and, and, yeah. Making, and also with Camper Van Beethoven, four albums in two years period. With that too, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I've noticed that a lot of people right now are putting a lot more time between their albums and spending a lot more time on the road. And we just the last few years thought, what if we do the opposite? Mm -hmm. What if we sort of tour a little less and record more music, even though the financial incentives are all backwards, <laughs> but, we'll, but why don't we just do that? And then we'll be just different than everybody else. But the thing about a double album, here's the thing about a double album is that not a lot of people are doing it now. Mm -hmm. It's ambitious. And it really requires you to, to, 
I know you think that there's a lot of throw, you know, a double album, there's gonna be a lot of throwaway stuff mm -hmm. on there. Mm -hmm. It's actually much harder to make somebody listen to a double album unless you make every song engaging, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so it was almost for us. It was just to raise the bar for us. Let's make a double album. Let's like really just raise the bar. I mean, you could put together an album of 10 songs when you're somebody like like Cracker, you know, we've been around for a long time. We can come up with 10 good songs. Right, right. But like, come up with like a double album is, is much more challenging. You've often talked to me about when you write, the character you're singing about sometimes uh -huh. is an unreliable narrator. Yeah, Are the, there those? where the, the, the character who's singing is not telling the truth, that's but you exact. as an audience member are supposed to understand that. Right, but that's difficult sometimes yeah. as the audience member because you're hearing the singer and uh -huh. you want, you know your fist is going, yeah, you're yeah. saying, yeah, I believe that too until you realize, oh wait, that's kind of skewed. Yeah. yeah. But this is what you write about. Now, are, on these records, are most of these people unreliable narrators, or are they more you? Or? They're, they're more, this time they're, I think they're more reliable. I mean, the main unreliable narrator is uh, the character in El Comandante, because he's obviously lying. <laughs> <laughs> they told us it was herbal tea. That's <laughs> what right. he says at one point, right? right? So there's the classic unreliable narrator. Hey, I didn't really, truthfully, I didn't really thought about analyzing the record in that way, but, um, um, yeah. Less so than normal. Less so than normal. normal. Yes. Well, let me take you back to two of the, the hits, the greatest hits from Cracker. Also, I think you're going to be playing with us, Low and Teen Angst. Yeah. Um, Teen Angst has always been a little bit of a mystery to me because you seem to be singing, I mean, it's a great anthemic yeah. song, except I'm not quite sure what the anthem is and I'm not quite sure how much your tongue is in cheek. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you care to tell people how much your tongue is in cheek. Well... Yeah, so, so the, the idea with that song is, and I don't know why I did it this way, it's just that throughout, through the first two verses he complains about all this stuff, right? That, you know, it's like, well, I need, you know, what the world needs now is a V8 engine, you know, it's like so you drive fast, yeah. basically, or I need another drink and all this stuff. But you get to the third verse and really you realize he's actually singing about this girl. And, you know, he can't get this girl, right? And so, so what the world needs now is a new Frank Sinatra so I can get you in bed. Right. But so the, everything that's come before that is a distraction. Um, and it's, you have to go all the way through the song to get to that, to where you realize so that's what he's it's singing it. about. So boy doesn't get girl. It's that's what is the, that? Is that number four in the songwriting uh, <laughs> a list of topics that you can write rock songs about? Four it, song it, does uh, boy doesn't get girl. It probably is, but the route that you took is probably mm -hmm. the most circuitous You're route within three minutes or so. Yes, um, absolutely. We, we, we took the long way around to get there. W were you aware when you wrote it that you had the, just this super hook? <laughs> I mean, did you know this was this is a hit in any in any world? Um, well, I, I actually remember where we had that song, but we didn't have the guitar lick. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and you know, which is a key part of it because it starts the song. Yeah. We had the song, we had the words. It was more or less right, but it was only really about three quarters there, you know. And, uh, and uh, we, me and Johnny were driving across country. We were moving our stuff from California to... Uh, of Richmond, Virginia, and we were in, we stopped for the night in Gallup, New Mexico, and we both had the guitars out in the ho hotel room. And he played, he plays that that riff is actually one note more blue, it has a flat note in it compared to the way I sing the rest of the song. Okay. And he just kind of accidentally sort of did this riff, like more like a blues lick, while we were sort of practicing that. I was like, that's really good. And and then so he worked he. He came up with that lick, which starts the song, and I don't think it. I don't think that song really is engaging without that lick. I mean, because it gets you right it does, at the beginning. I of think the, song. the very first term, time yeah. I heard that song, the, and before it developed yeah. at all, the riff got me. It was like, yeah. Uh, an advocate for artists' rights, yeah. or somebody who believes musicians should actually get paid for doing what they do. Right. Uh, you've been quite a controversial uh, man, a, a lightning rod for some people in this world. I think your position is probably a lot more complex than some people give you credit for. Well, I mean, we're in the old TLDR 
Do you know what the, you know, the internet that? people will write TLDR, too long, didn't read. Oh. Right? <laughs> Which is funny because I, I remember I actually had a blog where I sort of explained that nobody's really going to understand the mm. nuances of the, of the um, you know, how artists are paid unless they really dive into the details right. and in this too long, don't read world, most people don't know what they're talking about and stuff like that. And then somebody wrote, one of the first comments was TLDR, and I don't know if they were joking or not. Right. Um, yeah, it's it's nuanced. I, I mean, one of the reasons that I became the spokesperson for artist rights is because I always was. I mean, people forget that you know I started on an indie record label, and then we cut a deal with a major record label, um, largely on our own terms. You know, we we retained the rights to our songs. We retained the rights to many of our recordings as well. Um, and I've always been critical of whoever it is that pays artists, mm -hmm. right? I've mm -hmm. always been the person who's, who's talked about that, mm -hmm. right? And it's just by 2012 when I went to San Francisco Music Tech Conference, uh, where sort of the technology industry meets the music industry, I was largely seen as more of a friend of tech because of my background in math mm -hmm. and computers, my friendship with a lot of people mm -hmm. in that world. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's why I was there speaking. Um, but what I came out and said there was like, hey, it was, it, the title of the speech was provocative. It was uh, meet the new boss worse than the old boss, question mark. And it was rather polite speech, but what I wanted to point out was like, hey, uh, we've sort of been waiting 10 years now for this little sort of digital utopia. Some elements are better for artists. We, there's no gatekeepers. If I want to record some really wacky song and just put it on my website and you know put it out through Bandcamp or something like that, I can, right? There's yeah. not gatekeepers anymore. There's Gaia, there's it's Lord, a, there's people you, who do that. That's yeah, right. right. They become very successful. Doing right, and, yeah. and you see an explosion of independent artists. Yeah. And, and you know, so creatively, for artists, this is a golden age. Mm -hmm. But monetarily, when you really look at it, it's not. And, and not, only is it, not only is it that we're making less money, but in particular, my talk at San Francisco Music Tech didn't talk about the overall pie getting smaller. I just said, okay, here's the pie. Let's not worry about what size it is. Mm -hmm. And if you really look at it, the share of revenue, the percentage of revenue that artists get out of the pie is actually smaller than under the bad old record company system, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, artists for 10 years before that have had a pretty strong alliance with certain technology companies because they see themselves as, you know, financial, uh, creative liberators mm -hmm. and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And so I walk in and I go, yeah, yeah, you guys are kind of creatively our liberators, but you're actually taking more of the pie now than the old record labels mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. The distributors, whether they're digital or the record labels, they got rid of their expenses, but we still have to pay for recording. We still have to pay to go on the road and stuff like that. We, we have the same cost structure, so let it's ask, complicated. Let me ask you a question. Did you get screwed over in the pre-internet world by record companies, as many bands did? Um, Do you feel? Largely, I didn't. I mean, there's a famous story about <laughs> um, where Virgin Records tried to put out a second greatest hits. And, you know, in, in, in the music <laughs> world, you know, in the band world, you know, putting out a greatest hits record is a catalog killer because then the stores only stock one title and they don't right. stock the other four. You know, artists hate it, right? Yeah. But you're always obligated to do at least one greatest hits record. Right. Well, Virgin Records put out a second we found out through the grapevine they were putting out a second greatest hits record. The grapevine? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they didn't even tell us. Okay. And well, we weren't on the label anymore. And so we wrote them and said, hey, uh, you know, contractually you can't do this. And their answer was, uh, well, actually the way we read it, um, we can. Mm -hmm. Our belief is that we can do mm -hmm. this. So we thought about it for a while. We go, okay, are we going to have to sue the record label or what are we going to do? <laughs> And our manager at the time said, why don't we just record our own greatest hits and put it out the same day? And, and we started looking at it and we go, wow, they didn't call the, the new greatest hits that was coming out, they didn't call it greatest hits. It was, it was called Get Off This or Get On This, Get On This. Okay. It's called Get On This, 
best of cracker. Best of, okay. Right, yeah. so we thought, wow, well, here's an opportunity here right now. So while they were doing that, getting ready for that, we got the release date, we just went in the studio and we re-recorded mm -hmm. all of our songs the best we could and we just put out Cracker's greatest hits. On and we, your own label? On our own label. Mm -hmm. And, well, we licensed it to another mm -hmm. label, but it's our recordings. Mm -hmm. And uh, we put it out on exactly the same day that Virgin put out their greatest hits record. Mm -hmm. And we outsold them 10 to 1. And, and Lowe, tell me a bit about Lowe. Well, Lowe, Lowe's just a, you know, again, here, here but I'm gonna tell you, this is a song, this is another one of those five minute songs. It's almost just a throwaway. We were just jamming at Soundcheck in Portland, Oregon. I think the place was called La Luna then. It's had a bunch of different names. And we were just playing at Soundcheck and just grooving on this thing. And Johnny was trying all these different things. And then, I mean, it just it's just the Wizard of Oz crossed with Baudelaire, <laughs> you know, like most rock songs. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Uh, well, it is. I mean, there's references to the Wizard of Oz. There's references to Baudelaire. And then it's Be With You, Girl, like Lean Stone. Yeah, yeah. It, it's sort of one of those things that seems, it's so simple in some ways. Yeah. I mean, the it's chorus. Four it's four chords that just go the whole time. The yeah. only thing that changes is Davey plays a slightly different bass line and Johnny plays yeah. a different guitar part yeah. through the song. I'd like to thank David Lowry for doing Boston Appreciate Rock it. Talk here today. I'm Jim Sullivan, your host, and uh, we'd like to thank you for watching Boston Rock Talk on Xfinity.